Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm really excited uh, to be here today to talk, talk about uh, the implementation replication framework, uh, basically a framework we created to um, govern and help interpret uh, replications of implementation studies. Uh, so I'm going to kind of go over some basics about uh, replication, how it fits into open science, uh, and then dive into uh, two studies uh, that I did uh, on something called getting to outcomes, which is a bundle of implementation strategies um, that we did an initial study and then replicated it and had to make um, a lot of decisions and choices about how to set up the replication and also how to understand uh, the results. Uh, so I thought the best way to kind of do kind of a methods uh, webinar would be to just kind of go through a little bit blow by blow on these studies to sort of show how, you know, the kind of pull the pull the veil back on the, some of the decision making. Um, I don't think uh, we've got it all figured out necessarily, but I think the implementation replication framework does provide some nice guidance for people setting up uh, replications and then also uh, understanding them. Um, I, I don't know if, I, just a, two seconds on me, I'm uh, a psychologist um, and I split time between the RAND Corporation and the Pittsburgh uh, VA, been at both for about 23 years, 24 years, um, before implementation science was even a thing. Um, so, uh, but I've been doing a lot of uh, thinking about how to help organizations implement evidence-based practices. Um, and, I, and you know, because it's Friday, I'm wearing my Spider-Man tie with great power, comes great responsibility. So for those who are into Spider-Man or ties. All right, let's kind of get started. Um, okay. So this is based on a paper uh, that we did for prevention science. So a big part of my life, um, especially at RAND, is more in the community-based um, prevention world. Um, things like preventing substance abuse, preventing teen pregnancy. Um, you know, a lot of folk, a lot of uh, focused on youth. Um, so there was a special issue uh, that was put together on open science. And we had just uh, finished our second study, the replication study, and thought um, that it would be a nice contribution to uh, this issue to kind of think about replication, but from an implementation science point of view, which I don't think had really been done before. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about replication, but not specific to implementation science. So I thought it would be a good, uh, a, a good forum to discuss uh, these issues. And it was also uh, an opportunity to have my first pop culture title. I was very, very excited about that. Um, so this is uh, uh, based on Cool Hand Luke. You know, what we have here is a failure to communicate. So we adapted that to uh, what we have here is a failure to replicate. Um, so we had a fight. We had a fight with the journal about that, actually, but um, that we prevailed uh, in the end. So I figured it would be nice, you know, some point in my career to have kind of a more fun uh, title. But if um, you're interested in more details about this than we could sort of do here, um, you can check out uh, the paper in Prevention Science. So replication and open science. So you may have heard that there is a, you know, sort of a replication crisis going on, uh, especially in my home field of psychology, um, where a ton of studies um, are uh, sort of classic uh, psychology studies are not being uh, able to be replicated. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, reasons for that. I, I don't know if any of you were psych majors in college, as I was, you know, you're often uh, made to sort of voluntold to uh, to be a subject in uh, a study of the professors 
uh, or you have to write a big long paper. So we all chose to be uh, guinea pigs. But um, so a lot of these a lot of these studies are done on you know college uh, young college kids. Um, but a lot of other reasons why these studies aren't uh, getting replicated, and that's a problem, right? Because if studies are not getting replicated, that means we can't really be sure that the first result was a true result. And so um, that makes, you know, people like me very nervous because all of these classic theories or classic interventions that we come to rely on may not be as true um, as we had thought. Uh, so we want to avoid such a crisis in implementation science. It's, you know, we're a new younger field and, you know, we have the benefit to maybe not repeat some of the same mistakes that, um, you know, our academic uh, brethren have made. So science is, uh, there is this whole new-ish movement to have science be more open. So defined here as transparent and accessible knowledge that's shared and developed through collaborative networks. Um, so uh, this is being played out in a variety of ways, you know, uh, requirements by funders to use certain repositories uh, to place, you know, to make da data available um, so that others can, uh, not associated with the original research team, can take a look and sort of see if these uh, results are true. Journals are getting into the act too, uh, some by having certain mechanisms where you can um, uh, publish a sort of a protocol paper and then um, have a guaranteed publication regardless of positive or negative um, uh, later on if you, if you show that you stuck to the original methods that you proposed. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of have open science. Um, continuing on that, uh, on that vein is the Center for Open, uh, open Science has, has these guidelines um, that get at various aspects of open science. So uh, citation standards, uh, certain data uh, transparency, uh, analytic methods or code transparency, design and analysis this transparency, study re registration, analysis plan, uh, pre-registration, and then finally uh, replication. And so that's really what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, so not all replication studies are the same. Um, so there's uh, reproducibility, which really is about just kind of reanalyzing the data to see if um, all the results are, are hold. Um, so that's one kind. And then re true like replication is when you rerun the study. Um, there are two kinds of replications. There's direct replication where you really try to keep everything the same, just really run it back the same exact way to see if, you know, with different subjects, obviously, and uh, to see if you get the same result. Uh, and then there's conceptual replication. Uh, and that's where you vary key variables um, between the first time to the second time. And you might have certain reasons why you want to do that. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and there also might be situations where variables vary uh, without your, you know, your specific choice to vary them, but they just naturally uh, vary. And so those are all different kinds of conceptual uh, replications. But they all, all of these kinds of studies have the um, goal of corroborating previous uh, findings. Um, so in implementation research, replication, I would say, looks a bit different than replicating a clinical intervention or a program. Um, so for an EBP, for an evidence-based program or practice, I think the emphasis is typically on direct replication, like running it all the same. 
Uh, th there was this one um, uh, substance abuse prevention program called Project Alert. It was made by uh, some colleagues of mine at the Rand Corporation in the 90s. Uh, there was an initial uh, big trial in a whole bunch of schools. Um, and then in the early 2000s, they did another huge randomized trial of the same exact uh, program, also in schools with the same kind of kids. Um, so the goal here is, you know, if we just do it again with similar kids, do we get the same uh, result? And in, in this case, they they did. Um, so, but with an implementation strategy test, I would say the emphasis is more on conceptual replication. Be and this is really because implementation strategies are more useful when they can be applied across multiple EBPs in multiple settings. Um, and I, it just seems sort of common, like common sense, but I hadn't really sort of thought about it in this way until kind of working on this framework. Um, so you can imagine like audit and feedback. Um, audit and feedback is a pretty good implementation strategy because we can use it across all different kinds of clinical interventions in all different kinds of settings. That's why it's so useful. If a certain implementation strategy could only work in one kind of setting or in one kind of uh, evidence-based practice, I mean, that would be fine, but it would be less useful overall. And I think we would wanna know what the limits are for certain implementation strategies. Um, you know, if if they're only gonna be tied to certain clinical interventions, we wanna know that. And so then we can plan for that. Um, and so it's up till now, it's been challenging because um, studies uh, and the reviews of implementation strategies, they vary across content domains and settings and the exact usage of implementation strategies. And also a challenge has been that strategies are often done in bundles. So, but if the bundles are slightly changing, how do you know what you have from one study to the next? And um, this is a complete tangent, but I just just had to share this. So we're, uh, we're doing, I'm part of this effort at RAND to do a massive literature review of all implementation, ERIC implementation strategies and their effectiveness funded by PCORI. And so we've now gone through and coded, done our initial coding of all these studies. And there is, I think, out of all the studies we've looked at, there are maybe two that are doing a uh, like a randomized trial involving a single implementation strategy based i.e. I. not a bundle. So almost all the studies that are out that are being done are bundles of implementation strategies, making it you know really hard to kind of judge from one study to the next, you know, are you know the replication. So this this graph right here is a plot of all the Eric strategies against each other. So all the strategies listed on the top and all the strategies listed on the side. And then the cells, are the, the, the darker the green, the more um, studies that show up but uh, cross between those two specific strategies. So this line right here is facilitation. So you can see facilitation, like, some, like a lot of others is done with tons of other um, implementation strategies. So it just makes this whole idea of uh, replication that much more complicated in implementation science. And, in the, and replication was already complicated uh, enough. So we have uh, a lot to deal with in implementation science. So when I said before, there are two kinds of uh, replications, uh, I kind of lied. <laughs> um, so, but now I'm telling you the truth. Um, so re replications are actually really not purely direct or purely conceptual. It's, it's really more 
of, um, of a range. Um, so there are th this idea of closely aligned conceptual replication. So um, that's where it's uh, maybe close to being a, an exact replication of direct, but, but not exactly. And so it's, it's still then conceptual. Um, or a distal uh, conceptual replication where there's a bunch of things that are varying and it's sort of, it's kind of far, it's getting a little far away from the original. Um, and that could be derived from naturally occurring uh, variation um, from the original study, things that, you know, we cannot control. Um, uh, and it could also be like, can, we can ask the question, can an implementation strategy achieve the same result under a much uh, different set of circumstances? Um, and that could be something, again, that we purposefully vary because um, we want to see what the difference is, or it could be out of our uh, control. Um, so the key uh, takeaway, I think, is that it's just really helpful and pays, I think, to be clear on the differences between the original study and the replication study. So whether you're doing it on purpose or you're or you're, it's out of your control, I think it's really helpful just to be specifying what these differences are, because that will then help uh, you figure out how to interpret your results later on. So here we come to the implementation replication framework or the earth. And so I, I know it's like the thing to do is to come up with an acronym that is um, also a word in and of itself. Um, and I completely failed in that effort. And uh, IRF is probably the, the, the least sense, sensical uh, um, acronym around, but nonetheless, here we are. Um, so this uh, framework started with uh, Michael Coyne, um, who, who in 2016, created a framework around uh, replications for clinical interventions. Um, and so what we did was we started with that framework and then uh, tweaked it to account for uh, implementation science. Um, so I'm gonna go through each of these and then in the italicized text, you can see where we added. And then we, um, and then we did uh, sort of pull from sort of implementation science's kind of greatest hits um, to make uh, to make these tweaks. So these are just uh, a list of key uh, elements of a study that I think we all recognize are part of um, what make up a study. So participant setting intervention, and um, so implementation strategy is a new domain that was added to this uh, list of domains. Elena, do you have something you had? I do. Yes, we do have a question in the chat. Okay. Um, so the question is, is scaling a study up a replication or a new study? For example, if you increase the dose or length of time you do the thing with all else being the same, is that replication or a new study? This, um, I, well, a lot of times scaling up is often maybe not actually done as a study, but just sort of trying to get uh, implementation going. Um, but maybe the uh, the implementation part of the implementation study, um, I guess, is maybe what is being uh, asked about here. So I think um, there's probably a very fine line between um, you know, tweaking and adapting and doing something whole, you know, something so different that it's not the same thing anymore. I mean, that's sort of a classic uh, conundrum we have in implementation. Um, you know, so it could be that you're changing things to make it fit better into the into the context, um, and so that you know you have no choice. Um, and then if you're studying it on top of that, if you're like collecting 
you know, implementation data and outcome data, then I think you would be sort of you potentially would be in the realm of a conceptual uh, replication, right? If you're if you're making a whole bunch of changes because of your setting or your population, um, and then you're collecting similar data, and so that's another point I'll make later on about a lot of times you want to try to collect the same kind of information from study to study, so you could compare apples to apples. Um, then uh, you know I, that to me sounds like a like almost like a conceptual uh, replication. And so I mean it's a little bit I don't know potato potato uh, that you know uh, sort of tweaking things in, in a new place to try to uh, implement it across a wide range of people is sort of like a replication. Um, it's also I think also could be called uh, scaling up. So. Thank you. Sure. All right, so let's dive into more about the implementation replication framework. So the first are participants. Um, so really you got people who are students, learners, patients, sort of those who are kind of receiving the evidence-based practice, whether it's a program or a service or a clinical treatment or, or, or what have you. Um, and then there are certain um, elements or factors that you want to try to understand, um, whether it's their age or grade, if they're kids, um, disability, risk level, demographics. Um, so these all of these factors could play into um, what uh, affects results from one study to the next. Um, and the same with teacher or interventionist. Um, education, sort of uh, their certification and their experience, level of training with the intervention, demographics. And so here we have our first sort of implementation science ad from CIFR, from uh, Laura Damschroder's uh, framework, belief in and efficacy with the intervention and commitment uh, to the organization. Um, this is actually uh, CIFR 1.0 language. So I guess we'll have to update this for CIFR 2.0 that just came out. Um, but again, you can see how, uh, you know, what a uh, service deliverer and uh, teacher interventionist believes in what their efficacy is in um, uh, the intervention, their commitment to the organization. You can see how that varies from study to study. That could affect the results for sure. Um, okay, so the setting. Um, so the uh, first three, sorry, first six characteristics come from Coin's uh, framework. Uh, the location, how uh, urban or suburban or rural it is current practices, overall organization demographics, um, the intervention location and the size of the, an organization. And what we added to this are the inner and outer setting characteristics from CIFR. Um, so inner setting, like the structure, the culture, the climate, um, compatibility and outer setting, you know, understanding of participants' needs, the networking perceived pressure from other similar organizations, any mandates. So again, you can see how if these things um, varied from study to study that could affect uh, the results. And these kind of characteristics are really central to what we think about in implementation science and aren't, you know, weren't really uh, considered when just doing a straight direct replication of, um, of an EBP. So there's a question um, in the chat that is really interesting. Um, what if a recently done study is directly replicated and results are completely different? Does this represent bad science on the side of the original study? Um, I mean, right off the bat, I, I would say no, but I think it, uh, the less satisfying answer is I think it depends. Um, so I think when you take a look inside the, the two studies and kind of see, like see using something like the, the IRF, the IRF, um, and sort of do a postmortem, maybe there are some certain elements 
that varied between the two studies that led to um, you know the different results. Um, you know maybe um, you know your intervention. You know, you were even though it's the same intervention, maybe you had to switch to a different interventionist in the second study because the first the person from the first study wasn't available or. Um, there could be a, a, a lot of different uh, reasons. And one of the reasons could also be is that maybe the results from the first one were spurious. Maybe they weren't, I mean, maybe they were honestly gained. You know, there wasn't any cheating or anything going on, but maybe it just the results were not really real. Uh, and so, and that I don't think is necessarily bad science. I think it's actually great science that you do the replication and you find out that maybe the thing that you thought was working maybe doesn't work as as broadly as you thought. So that's actually a good thing to find out. We should be celebrating, I think, null results more than we do. We all know about the sort of the positive finding bias that occurs in journals and things. So we should, you know, we should definitely um celebrate null results more. All right, so, so the intervention. Um, so all these different kinds of aspects I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, the content focus, the design, the dosage, the pacing, uh, fidelity, amount of support for interventionists. And so from also from CIFR, but and also from Dean Fixon's uh, core implementation components, we add um, belief in the intervention's evidence, the, um, its advantage over a previous intervention, adaptability, complexity, design quality, um, staffing, quality of staffing, implementer training, monitoring, and feedback. Um, all of these, again, could affect the degree that you get results differently the second time around. So the implementation strategy, this is brand new for the, the in this framework, um, sp obviously specific to implementation science where we're gonna be maybe testing an implementation strategy. Um, these uh, elements here are right out of uh, Enola Proctor's uh, ways to kind of classify and uh, talk about implementation strategies, the actor, the action, the action targets, it's temporality, temporality, dose, theoretical justification, um, all the sort of the ways that we should all be describing implementation strategies um, uh, in our studies. So we want to have a really good understanding of the implementation strategy that's getting used from one study to the next. Is it exactly the same, or do they do the strategies vary um, from one? Uh, study to the next. So outcome measures. Um, here, I think we kind of focus on the consistency uh, with original measures. So if you do uh, a replication, are you going to actually be collecting the same data the, the second time around? Um, so, you know, the level of alignment with the intervention, um, standardized measures. Um, so you'll see in this example that I give, we don't use, we use some similar measures and then some others that are different, but also similar in, in the same kind of way. So I'll uh, become more clear in a bit. Um, but you want to make sure that there is at least some consistency between the measures between the two studies. Otherwise, you won't be able to make any valid comparisons. Um, and what we add here uh, for implementation science is in the explicit focus on implementation as an outcome. So obviously, um, you know, the, the emphasis on, you know, clinical interventions is, you know, is really the final clinical outcome. Did people change in the way that you wanted? But in implementation science, we really want to think about and focus on implementation as well, obviously. So things like, you um, collecting fidelity data, dosage data, quality of delivery, these become, uh, take on, a, I think, a greater importance in implementation science studies than in other areas. And so that's sort of the add. Um, 
<laughs> Russ is uh, Russ Glasgow is waxing eloquent in in ways that are very long. <laughs> I but I which are great. I just it takes a minute to uh, to read, but I will get to that. Um, the uh, so he the, the last two are research design and analyses. These are pretty much uh, untouched in terms of the old framework. Um, and so all the research designs are up, you know, for use here. Um, but things like, you know, power, assignment to condition, level of attrition, uh, the counterfactual, um, level of analysis, analytic approach. You know, again, you want to use, you know, you know, similar approaches from the across the two studies. Um, and these are additional factors that could affect the results. Um, so replicating implementation studies can lead to a different path. Um, so for an EBP, you know, usually the typical path is, you know, an efficacy study, you do the study in setting one, so it's setting one, EBP one, and then basically you do the same thing again in the same setting, same EBP. Um, that's sort of a typical pathway. But when you're testing an implementation strategy, I would uh, I would wager it's really helpful to start by you know with setting one strategy one EBP one, and then you could do a replication that is the same kind of setting, same strategy, but a different EBP, and that would be a really useful way to sort of gauge the robustness of a, a, a implementation strategy. Um, and and I will show you a uh, an example of that right now. So um, we did uh, two studies on something called getting to outcomes or GTO for short. Um, and uh, GTO has been around since 2004. So uh, we got our start when we were working with community, uh, coalitions and other community-based organizations who were trying to do prevention. Um, and we were brought in as the evaluator for a lot of these initiatives and noticed that while folks were working hard and really well-meaning, that some of the choices that they were making were not the most evidence-based and that they all often didn't have the sort of the skills and understanding of prevention to do the best that they could do. And that so it boils down to is that they needed assistance in some way. And we as evaluators and longtime prevention researchers had a lot of that knowledge. And we basically created GTO to help these community-based organizations translate uh, their ideas into action in an evidence-based way. Um, so, th so then after putting together, uh, getting to outcomes and doing a number of sort of pilot trials and sort of open label evaluations and quasi experimental trials, we got the opportunity to get two NIH grants um, to fund these two uh, studies. And together, they are uh, a conceptual uh, replication. So getting to outcomes is a, uh, a process model or an or an action model, which is according to Per Nelson, is sort of a subset of a process model. And that basically means that um, it's a model that specifies the steps uh, in the process to translate research into practice. Um, and it provi you know, provides practical guidance um, in the planning and execution of implementation endeavors. Um, and uses implementation strategies to facilitate implementation. Um, so we have a 10-step model here. Um, these steps will not surprise you at all. <laughs> uh, they're basically um, you know, pulled from literature on planning and evaluation and quality improvement and just organized into a package that uh, we think is a lot easier for community-based organizations or organizations of any kind to understand. Um, so it, um, 
starts, well, my laser pointer went away. Oh, there you go. Um, so it starts with a needs assessment where you choose what you need to focus on, then identify goals and target population and desired outcomes, look for best practices. Then once you kind of have a sense of the best practices you want to implement, kind of assess those practices based on your um, how well they fit within your setting, your organization, whether the degree to which you have capacity to do them or need more capacity. Then you finally decide on those uh, uh, practices you want to do, and you do a detailed plan, uh, in, including um, how to evaluate it. Uh, so those first six steps are sort of the preparatory work. Then you deliver the program, and then you get into evaluating and improving, where you do uh, this step seven is um, process evaluation, sort of tracking the implementation. Step eight is outcome evaluation. How do people change? Uh, then you take all that data and look back at your previous steps and decisions and do a detailed quality improvement process where you make a, and then make a plan for um, the next time you're going to do the program. And then the last step is uh, sustainability. How are you going to keep it going? Um, so the idea is that we then present this model to folks and then provide a number of implementation strategies to help walk them through that model with quality. Um, the main GTO components are a, a manual of text and tools, training, and technical assistance or facilitation. So we often, we got started by saying technical assistance, um, but the technical assistance that we meant was really what became later known as uh, facilitation. Um, I think, so technical assistance, I think, has come to mean a lot assistance that is very technical and, and kind of reactive, uh, like, you know, like calling someone to help you with a computer thing, um, asking a very specific question. Our technical assistance that we uh, said, again, before, this is before implementation science got even started, um, was, you know, a very proactive, we go to you, we help troubleshoot all the things that facilitation um, involves. So we kind of use them interchangeably. Um, so if you think about GTO from an ERIC uh, lens, uh, we our main strategies are training and educating stakeholders, providing, we do do some actual technical assistance, some very specific technical things, but facilitation. We use a lot of um, multiple evaluated and uh, iterative strategies because we, we help them analyze their data, give them a feedback report, and do that kind of evaluation iteration. Uh, a big part of what we do is help adapt and tailor to the context. One of the most challenging, I think, things about uh, working with evidence-based practices um, uh, from scratch, from new, is taking them off the shelf and putting them into your place. And so that is a very difficult task uh, for organizations to take on and that we spend a lot of time trying to help organizations tailor various um, uh, programs, services to a new context, and then support clinicians and practitioners. We do some working on stakeholder relationships, trying to help navigate um, with leadership, sometimes rearranging infrastructure to make the evidence-based practice go better. And we usually don't work di with directly with consumers or financial strategies. So um, over the years, we've done a number um, of applications of the getting to outcomes approach to many different content domains. And we usually anchor those different applications in a manual. Um, so we've done uh, sexual assault prevention in the military, uh, homelessness in the VA. Um, we apply getting to outcomes to a, a youth developmental asset model. Um, and then the first um, one we did was uh, straight up sort of youth-based drug prevention. Um, but we've done also underage drinking and teen pregnancy, um, a number of different applications. So each time the approach, the 10-step approach is the same, but the content of the how you apply the 10 steps changes from uh, application to application. So I mentioned uh, uh, 
So the manual of text and tools, this is just an example to give you a sense of what we mean. So the top part here is sort of the a blank version of, and we keep tweaking this at every time we do a new manual, but um, this is what we called our goals tool, which helps you uh, write out a goal, which we say is a broad statement of what kind of change you want, and then a corresponding desired outcome that come off of that goal uh, to make it more operationalized. Uh, we use uh, the, the SMART, the SMART checklist, um, to make those desired outcomes very um, concrete. Here, this one is out of our teen pregnancy prevention manual. So we wanted to know the degree to which all these were aligned with different kinds of outcomes. Um, and here is an example of this filled in. Um, uh, so the whole idea behind these tools is that you um, they prompt you for certain action and decision making and then provide a way to record the um, the results of your decisions. So you can have them, save them, and then revisit them and revise them uh, later on and also share them with your technical assistants or your facilitation uh, coaches. And so we have lots of tools for each. Each of the 10 steps has their own tool that kind of moves the work along in this way. And, um, and here's a kind of a flow chart. Um, so the uh, we typically have a two-year training and TA process um, where you start off with, you get trained in the first few steps of GTO, like needs assessment, goal setting, picking your programs, and then you get training in that EBP. The whole time you're iterating with your technical assistance provider on these tools. So you send them to your TA provider, they make, ch make changes, suggestions, have conversations, send them back, tweak them, and then kind of iterate until they can, until both the, the site and the TA feels really good about them. And then moving on to the next block of training, sort of fit um, capacity and planning. Again, more tools, more iteration. Um, then do the, uh, the EBP, work to collect fidelity and outcome data. Um, and then that all gets crunched in a what we call our CQI evaluation and CQI workshop, where we talk about how to interpret process evaluation data, outcome evaluation data, how to kind of tell the whole story of the, uh, of the program, uh, create a narrative, and then make changes for the next time, make improvements. And then you kind of rinse and repeat the whole thing again, and then end with a sustainability training at the end. So our first go around in the first study, um, we averaged about 44 hours of technical assistance facilitation per site. Um, and we'll, you'll see how that kind of figures into the story uh, in the replication later on. Uh, the GTO logic model um, starts with the implementation support, i.e. GTO. Um, we try to build capacity. That's the main, that's like the sort of the proximal um, thing that we target. So we're talking about knowledge, attitude, and skills on how to do all the actions in the GTO 10 steps. And then we, uh, that leads to theoretically better performance. So how well you do goal setting, how well you do capacity, um, uh, ensuring capacity, how well you do planning evaluation, leading to better fidelity or better quality implementation, leading to um, better outcomes. And you'll see that this uh, logic model really informs the, um, the measures that we use. All right, so the first study, um, this was, um, so you can see here on the left are some features of the implementation replication framework, and then some basic information in the middle um, from study one. Um, so the first study focused on teen pregnancy prevention. Um, a lot of times um, these studies are kind of a melding together of opportunity and science. Um, you know, we have certain ideas about how we want to run these studies, but then we have to do them. You know, we do our studies in the real world. They're not sort of in a lab. And so you need to kind of find collaborators and partners. So we had some opportunity to work with boys and girls clubs. 
um, and specifically middle school youth who were attending those boys and girls clubs in Alabama and in Georgia. Um, and this was mostly an Afri you know, a highly African-American population of kids. Um, and then we also had the opportunity to collaborate uh, with um, the Jamats who created a program called Making Proud Choices, MPC for short, um, which is a teen uh, pregnancy prevent and sexually transmitted infection prevention program. I'll go into a little bit more detail about those. Um, and then our implementation strategies is going to be getting to outcomes, the manual, the training, 44 hours of TA per site over the two years. And then the outcome measures were sex behaviors, knowledge and attitudes about sex and condoms. Um, and then we have a number of measures of what we call performance, adherence, and then delivery quality. And this was really a cluster randomized hybrid three trial was basically an EBP versus EBP plus GTO. So we had 32 boys and girls clubs that we had access to. So I don't know if folks um, are familiar with boys and girl clubs or have been around them very much, but um, they're great uh, places for kids. Um, they provide a, you know, a safe place to go after school. Um, they are supposed to be doing um, certain kinds of programs, but from when we got there and we kind of looked around, there wasn't really a ton of structured program going on. Um, and there was some mentoring happening, but not, not a ton. So it really did seem like it was a great opportunity to kind of offer up a evidence-based uh, program. The program we were doing called Making Proud Choices um, with the, gotta, don't forget the exclamation point, the Jamats get mad if they don't have the exclamation point. Um, so it's it's an eight uh, session, uh, eight one hour sessions targets uh, a number of risk and protective factors around uh, sex behaviors, sort of what your knowledge and awareness is of different uh, STIs, HIV, condoms, especially very heavy focus on use of condoms, um, behavioral beliefs, um, like how, uh, you know, becoming pregnant or or uh, getting another person pregnant could interrupt your goals and dreams. Um, and then also um, a key feature I thought that was interesting was this hedonistic belief, the idea that you can make condoms part of the um, part of the fun of having sex, basically. Um, and then attitudes about contraception, safe sex and condom use, perceptions of risk, and then skills uh, affecting the sex frequency and then protected sex frequency, consistent condom use, um, and then ultimately teen pregnancies and HIV or other STIs. So uh, Making Proud Choices had a really strong evidence base, multiple trials with large samples um, found a wide range of uh, positive results. Um, more condom knowledge, better uh, pro-social attitudes and tensions, more consistent condom use across multiple trials, um, uh, and also, you know, either less sex overall or less unprotected sex. So we were starting with a pretty strong evidence-based practice. Um, so uh, the data collection instruments, um, we, most importantly, we monitored our TA. So we had um, we tracked every minute. Um, and then we also did something called a performance interview where we interviewed folks um, to, uh, after each year uh, and then assessed how well they were doing on all those key areas of GTO, like the planning, the evaluation, the goal, goal setting um, from a high five to a low of one. We did heavy fidelity monitoring, send uh, observers into the class um, to calculate on an adherence level, and then also multiple uh, measures of delivery quality and, and then attendance. And then we surveyed the kids multiple times on sex behaviors and then sex attitudes, beliefs, around also and also on condoms. So when you look at year in year one, the GTO sites had better uh, performance across the across all uh, GTO uh, steps and behaviors. Um, 
if you when you look at year two, that trend continues and it's even more. Um, the red here is year two in the GTO uh, condition. So there was strong, um, they were really learning and doing all the activities that we were preaching in GTO. So on, on basically how to run a program. When you look at uh, adherence in year one, um, so uh, they were pretty, the two groups were pretty similar. So here, the green are the number of activities done in full. Yellow is partially and red is not at all. GTO sites had slightly less um, not at all ratings on their adherence. Uh, but the big improvement was in year two where uh, the GTO sites go from about half of their uh, activities being rated in full to almost all of their activities being rated in full, whereas the, the MPC only group pretty much stayed the same at around half. And all the stuff in the middle, that's just the science gobbledygook saying that this was all significant. Um, so in year one, no difference on classroom delivery across all, all multiple uh, measures of classroom delivery. But in year two, um, the, all of these were significant favoring the GTO condition. So the GTO sites definitely improved their delivery quality the second time, the second year. Uh, attendance was pretty much similar between year and one, year two. The MPC only group kind of fell off a little bit. The GTO group kind of increased, but not so not statistically significantly. And then uh, on outcomes, the big, when we looked at everything, sort of abstinence, condoms, knowledge, uh, sex behaviors. Um, and we started off with about a uh, little less than 500 to 400 kids, mostly African-American, about equal male, female. These are middle schoolers, um, had pretty good response rates. Um, but in year two, um, there was really no change in year one uh, on any of these outcomes. But in year two, the con uh, basically use of condoms, um, or not you sorry, not use of condoms, but all condoms attitudes and intentions and beliefs and knowledge basically uh, improved a lot more with in the GTO condition. So the year one is in the middle. You can see that's pretty similar across the two groups. Whereas in uh, year two, the GTO group was, was improving more than the non-GTO group. Um, and there were no other significant outcomes. So now we get to the point where we want to do a replication. Um, so again, you have your uh, IRF um, elements here on the left. We had all of our decisions from the first study. So now how are we gonna set up this replication to make, you know, to get the most out of this? Um, so the first thing we pretty much knew off the right off the bat was that we were gonna do getting to outcomes again. That was gonna be our main implementation strategy. But the big change that was that was here was that we decreased the number of TA hours by a fair amount. Um, and going back to some of our earlier studies where we had like high availability of technical assistance providers, um, over the years from study to study, we've been trying to shrink down the number of hours to the smallest amount where we can still get an impact. Because um, you don't want to really, you know, TA is expensive and you don't want to have to give any more then you absolutely have to give. So we decreased it a, you know, a fair amount. So that was one change that we made. Um, we also, we decided that we, we really liked working with boys and girls clubs. We thought it was a great setting. Um, and, and because I think the setting is fairly, uh, and, and quite unique, but pretty um, has a certain kind of characteristics, we wanted to kind of use the same set of characteristics there. So we had the opportunity to collaborate with um, an umbrella organization over all of these boys and girls clubs in this Southern California area. And so we stuck with boys and girls clubs, but this time it was a mostly Latinx population as compared to before, which was mostly African-American. So that was a difference. 
And then the focus of the EBP was completely different, although in some ways similar. But not. So it was uh, a program called Choice, which is confusing because it shares the word with the first EBP, but it is different. Um, and Choice is an after school um, voluntary drug prevention program um, that was created by a colleague of mine at RAND, Luz D'Amico. Um, it's also got a much smaller footprint. It's instead of eight one hour sessions, this was only five half hour sessions, so a lot less, um, and focusing on, on drug prevention. Um, and so the outcome measures were all really about drugs. Um, and so even though this was very different on, in one sense, it did sort of follow a similar approach of trying to target attitudes and beliefs about a negative behavior um, and trying to give kids skills to uh, avoid that use and think about other activities and ways to kind of get out, getting out of uh, how to use that. And so then the measures followed along similarly. So uh, we had similar um, implementation measures. Um, we again used our prevention performance interview because the that interview really focuses on the GTO behaviors of the 10 steps and um, not necessarily the content to which they are being applied to. Um, also, we broke down the curriculum and uh, assessed them in, in, uh, on adherence in the same sort of non-partial full way via observers in the same way we did in the first study. And then we did have delivery quality, but it was a different measure here. Um, it mostly was around motivational interviewing, which is a big part of the choice intervention. Um, MI is sort of a, a more, um, a less sort of a prescriptive approach and really elicits um, the folks that you're working with to kind of get them see the pros and the cons, not just sort of hitting them over the head with saying, you've got, you've got to stop using or, um, so it's a much more engaged approach. And there's a, uh, a motiva motivational interviewing scale that we use to uh, assess delivery quality and the similar kind of design, cluster randomized hybrid three, EBP versus EBP plus GTO. So you can see here that there is a bunch of things that are the same, but then also a bunch of things that are different that you know could have an impact. This, I know this how it all works out. The suspense is, is killing you. Um, so we had um, the opportunity to work with 29 boys and girls clubs um, and in the same kind of uh, design. So more just about choice. Um, it provides information about normative feedback on alcohol and, and marijuana use. This is the idea that kids often overestimate what they think other kids are doing in terms of using drugs. And so then that exerts a pressure on them to use. And so when you actually tell them that in fact, you know, even though maybe more kids are using than we want, most kids in fact are not using drugs. Uh, challenge realistic, un, uh, unrealistic beliefs about substances to resisting pressure to use and using this MI approach to discuss the benefits of cutting down and stopping, discussing ri risky situations. Choice also had an evidence base, but clearly not as much as making proud choices did. Um, there was two trials um, and there was there was an alcohol result in both, but it did not have the wide range of uh, outcomes as the first one did, which is, I think, another factor to keep in mind. Same two-year training and TA process, initial training, working with TA providers, filling out these tools, more training, more tools, doing the program, getting the evaluation data, doing continuous quality improvement, repeating the whole cycle again, and then ending with sustainability. Again, less hours of technical assistance this time around. The logic model, pretty much the same. Support, capacity, performance, fidelity, outcomes, the same, uh, the same logic model. Um, the assessments, again, pretty much some same, some slightly different. We did the performance interview. We actually added a knowledge check to that. Um, uh, same kind of fidelity monitoring with adherence, quality, delivery, and dosage. 
And we, again, just like in the previous study, we used a youth survey to assess outcomes. Um, again, instead of asking about sex behaviors, we're now asking about drug behaviors and also uh, attitudes, intentions, beliefs. So in the results, the we're putting sort of uh, year one and year two together here. Similar to the first study, uh, the GTO sites had better, um, uh, well, this is knowledge actually, which we didn't assess in the first one, but they had better knowledge about um, uh, GTO kind of activities in somewhat in year one, but mostly, you know, definitely in year two. So back to the performance measure, way favoring GTO. So uh, the GTO sites were definitely adopting these GTO -like behaviors um, way more than, um, than the control sites, you know, things around planning, evaluation, goal setting, um, very similar to the first study. When we look at adherence, again, the results are pretty similar in year one. The, uh, the GTO site and the non-GTO sites, their adherence was pretty similar. About two thirds were in full uh, in both groups. Um, but then in year two, um, the GTO condition goes up to 88% uh, of their activities rated in full, whereas the, uh, the choice only group stays pretty much the same. And, this, and the overtime result was also the same. Um, we uh, wanted to see, well, how close were we were to the original uh, choice uh, randomized trial, and we were pretty close. We were at 88% rated full, while the choice RCT was 90%. So we pretty much got what the original developers uh, achieved. When we're talking about delivery quality, there were multiple different kinds of ways to look at how well um, a motivational interviewing was being done in these sessions. Um, for the most part, um, uh, especially the sort of the, the summary uh, measure and the percent of MI adherency um, was favoring GTO in both years and pretty close and over the what the motivational interviewing people say is the threshold and also very close to what was achieved in the choice um, uh, RCTs. So we were able to really replicate uh, that, whereas in the uh, non-GTO condition, they weren't able to replicate that. And so this is pretty similar to what we saw in the first study around delivery quality. Uh, attendance, also similar to what we saw in the first study, no real impact uh, between GTO and choice. Uh, so again, we looked at all these outcomes on uh, use of alcohol and uh, marijuana and cigarettes and all these proximal outcomes, these beliefs, norms, uh, intentions. And we basically found pretty much no impact between the GTO and the control condition, um, whether we're talking about alcohol or, or marijuana. So in summary, um, we, uh, between the two studies, our prevention performance measure, both found GTO was superior. The curriculum uh, adherence in both uh, studies, GTO sites were superior. For delivery quality, in both studies, GTO was uh, superior. In youth outcomes, um, in the teen pregnancy study, we did find condom attitudes and intentions improve more in the second year for GTO, no other differences. Um, and we found really no outcomes in the drug use study in the replication. Both of those instances really suffered from low base rates, I should say, suffer in quotes. Uh, we were basically sad because they weren't uh, having uh, enough sex or using enough drugs. So we're, I know we're terrible people for thinking that, but that's basically sort of why there wasn't a lot of change there. Um, so why, so some results were the same, a lot of results were the same, but some were different. Um, and I think when you look between the, some of the key differences according to the implementation replication framework, you kind of see uh, some clues about maybe why that was. So I think first off, um, 
that choice is a uh, is an intervention that's got a, it's just less robust. Um, it's way smaller, and it doesn't it didn't have I think the strong evidence base that making prior choices did. And so even though we delivered a lot of the same um, implementation results, we didn't get those same outcomes. And it could be that there's something about choice that didn't just deliver the same amount of outcomes. Um, also, the difference in getting to outcomes support could have also, I think, contributed to this. Maybe we over or we corrected or reduced that number of uh, number of hours of support too much. And we might have, you know, slightly watered down uh, the impacts. Um, and also the um, the motivational interviewing um, is a harder, it's a harder intervention to deliver really, because I think motivational interviewing asks you to kind of deliver uh, in a certain way, in a very non-judgmental, kind of very open and engaging way. And not all of, uh, you know, not everyone could do that. Even though we got pretty good MI adherence, um, I think there was still some, there were times where we noticed that it wasn't as MI as it, as it could have been. So these are some, I think, of the clues. And so I think um, ultimately we felt fairly confident that you know GTO as an implementation strategy was able to deliver um, you know kind of replicate but it's not a it's not a yes or no answer um, even despite the, the the name the title of the article um, you know failure to replicate and a lot of times you know people when you hear about replication you people often talk about it this way is like well that did that replicate or did it not replicate um and so the answer is usually it's a lot more nuanced than that and that some aspects um are you know replicated and maybe some are not and so you can kind of see that here in this trial that we got a lot of implementation replication but not as much outcome replication So uh, starting to wrap up here, um, replications of programs can be confounded. Replications of implementation strategies can be really confounded. Um, so you know we have uh, two you know two things going on. We got the implementation strategy and the evidence based uh, practice, along with like the setting and all those other things. So. I think implementation studies are even more complicated around replication because of that whole extra layer of implementation strategies. Um, so like what happens when the programs are, you know, they differ or and how easy they are to implement or when settings have different levels of capacity um, or there's different levels of involvement from the program developers. We, in our replication study, we, um, we were constantly trying to keep uh, Liz D'Amico away from, uh, from, from this because we didn't want a ton of developer involvement because we wanted it to be really a, a replication. And we didn't really have that with Jamas. We had a, a little bit of contact with them. So we were really, we really tried to make it equal in that way. Um, but that can be something that can vary as well. So there's, just, there's just like a, a very a large number of factors that can make things vary. But I think the the IRF is at least provides some structure about which to think about these things in an organized way to see how they influence the results the, the second time around. And they can help you set up a, a replication study so you can think about these things ahead of time and then interpret uh, the results as well. So I've been talking a lot. We have, I think, about 15 minutes. Um, I, I don't know, Elena, we can just throw it open for people just can, I don't know if you want to unmute people or or whatever, but we could just have a conversation about or answer some questions. Yeah, absolutely. I I think we do still have um about the one question that you mentioned from Russ oh, here. Okay. Uh, let me see the camera. <laughs> And then if um, folks have other questions, feel free to enter them in the chat, or you can use the raise hand function, and we can go ahead and unmute you if you'd like to ask a question verbally. Yeah, 
Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's what to report is a, is a great question. Um, I mean, I like this sort of like these tables, like, um, you know, whether you're using something like the, the IRS to kind of structure like sort of the, you know, what it looked like in the first study, what it looked like in the second study, maybe as like a, um, you know, as an appendix or like a supplemental kind of uh, thing to, to include with a paper. But I mean, it could be, you know, even something like this could be, you know, maybe it's almost like a, like a consort statement kind of thing. You know, maybe it could be almost like required to be part of what gets reported uh, with replication studies. Great, and then it, it looks like Allison also put a question in the chat. Um, she says she's wondering if there's a benchmark by which you decide whether a study should be replicated. Oh uh, yeah, that's um, yeah, only when all primary outcomes were achieved, as an example. I mean, yeah, that's a great question. I think um, I don't know if there's a hard and fast rule around that. I mean, I think you definitely want to have um, some positive results, and um, but like how many and whether it's all of them, I, I think that, that might be sort of too much to, to specify uh, for or too high a bar to set, I think, because um, I mean, what study gets like every single primary outcome to be significant. I mean, sometimes, but you don't necessarily always get it all. So I think there has to be enough of a signal to I think warrant, you know, taking another look. That's all I see in the chat so far, but I actually have a quick question um, while others might be, you know, pondering their own questions. Um, so for folks who are new to this, um, new to new to replications, just kind of wondering if you have some um, kind of key considerations. I mean, you've mentioned kind of a, a wide range of things, of course, through this talk, but um, key kind of considerations um, and tips for folks who are who are new to the idea of replications and are you know considering whether they want to pursue um, a replication based study. Um, oh, so many. Um, um, I know. So one thing that I uh, that I, I think I mentioned earlier was like, do you still have the same people? available to you to to you know work on the study the second time around and i um you know that can sort of cut i think both ways like if you have all the same sort of interventionists and people um that does provide consistency um but on, this, on the other hand if you have a whole say all new staff and all new interventionists that could then lead one to think well um this could be scaled up more easily if we can do it with a whole new cast of folks. So in our in our two studies, our TA providers were different uh, between the two studies. Um, so um, it led me to think that, you know, this was something that we could train lots of people on. It wasn't just specific to, like, we had a great uh, TA provider and that was where, you know, we found all our results based on that. Um, and then, um, Availability of sites, I think, is always a consideration. I mean, it's true for if you're not doing a replication, but even, um, you know, it seems like, you know, when you do vary the kind of setting, that has a pretty huge impact. Um, so that's a big consideration. Can you get like another group of similar set kind of places to, to, have, to have the study take place in? Thank you. Uh, and Allison, I saw Allison wrote in the chat that um, your response to her question really makes it hit uh, hit home how important it is to continue the efforts to specify our strategies. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, we've always tried with gig outcomes, at least we've really tried, you know, we have this like TA monitoring form where we, where we track every minute. We actually 
we track it by GTO step and you know overall. And um, so we really do try to kind of measure our own strategies um, with a ver in various ways to kind of really have a sense of exactly what we're doing and not doing. Are there any additional resources that you would recommend or publications that you would recommend folks look into beyond what you shared with us today, um, you know, to continue to familiarize the, their, themselves with replication and this framework? Um, so you could always check out COIN 2016's article, the original article um, is one. Um, and then I think the... Um, the open science guidelines, I think, uh, are also a good place to get. So that, and what's nice about that um, uh, has been that you can also, you can learn about replication, but you can also learn about other areas of open science as well. Um, so so th those are some good guidelines and they have, they have links to other resources uh, through those guidelines. Um, Response to the paper, um, modest. <laughs> I, so it's funny. I gave a I gave a talk, uh, more like a, a higher level version of this, not all the detail, um, to uh, Bo Kim's uh, center, um, and got a bunch of questions in the vein of, yeah, this is what we should be doing, but no one does it. So you know. No one's going to do it anyway. So why even, why bother? Um, so I thought that was an int interesting uh, response. Um, I think uh, there could be more that's done to institutionalize uh, replications. So um, you know, funding streams that specifically are for that journal, like you know, how journals can ha have columns. Um, like, you know, there could be like a replication column within um, the journals that's, you know, that sp specifically are reserved for replications, whether they're positive or negative. Um, so I think, you know, I think some things need to change um, to make this more uh, take root a little bit, because I think, you know, there's a natural tendency, I think, to focus on the original discovery rather than sort of just uh, showing that it works again. Although I think showing that it works again is, pro is probably even more important in, in a lot of ways. Um, um, so there was a question around with the defined amount of TA provided in the study, was that on a set schedule? Um, yeah, so, and who do you, it, it was, yeah. So we, uh, in both studies, um, we did respond to idiosyncratic needs. Um, in, uh, just in the second study, we put a little bit more of a cap on it um, in that we just didn't make ourselves as available. Um, but we, we attempted in both studies to have a kind of a set schedule of uh, sessions between the TAs and the sites. Um, and so we usually, because we couldn't help ourselves <laughs> and uh, you know, we want people to succeed, we usually respond, you know, when we get a query or, you know, that's reasonable um, and within our power to affect. Uh push her as a field to comment on potential. Yeah, I I, I love that idea, Allison. Um, but and I I think um, yeah, I mean I the, having the journals uh, be involved in this would really change things, I think, uh, because they, you know, were also focused on getting papers published that I think it would definitely, uh, it would, it would very much affect behavior. It's Friday, people are tired. <laughs>
Well, I'm not seeing more questions right now. Maybe we can hang on for a few more seconds. Um, mm -hmm. But I did just want to make a couple of closing announcements. Again, we did record this session um, and we'll be sharing the recording, um, which will be posted in our Implementation Science Hub YouTube playlist with all participants, um, as well as a PDF copy of the slides. And we'll also be sending a link out to a brief evaluation form and would really love um, all of your feedback to, to you know, hear, hear what you thought of this session and any suggestions you might have for future methods workshops. Um, Dr. Chinman, do you want to share any final comments with the group? Uh, no, nothing, just uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um to present and um, yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun thinking about these concepts and your questions have been great. Um, and if folks have any uh, questions that, uh, about replications or if you're thinking about doing a replication, uh, you know, feel free to reach out and be happy to talk to you about it. Great, and I'll share Dr. Chinman's contact as well with, with participants if you wanna reach out directly. Um, thank you so, so much for this amazing presentation. You, I think you're seeing a couple of things. You, thank yous coming into the chat as well. Um, really appreciate your time. And thanks to everyone on the line with us for your great questions and participation. Have a good one, everyone.